And circling back to our top story, Thailand's opposition parties trounce their military-linked rivals in Sunday's poll. But there's uncertainty in the formation of the next government and the appointment of the future prime minister. We're joined by Professor Duncan McCargo. He is the director of the Nordic Institute of Asian Studies at the University of Copenhagen. Professor McCargo, you have been on the ground for weeks monitoring the election rallies of different parties up until polling day on Sunday. Now, I asked you this just before Sunday, what your final thoughts were based on what you had seen and heard. I'm going to quote to you and put you on the spot. Now, you said the conservative, conservative side are very likely going to lose the election, but they plan to win the post-election. With the numbers now out at 99% of the count, do you stand by that comment? Yes, I do. Yeah, it might seem, you know, if Thailand was a normal country, you'd assume that these two opposition parties that have secured uh, far more seats than the former government parties would now in a pos be in a position to get together and form a government. But things might not pan out exactly like that. I'd like to believe they'd pan out like that, but there are quite a number of obstacles along the way which could result in something rather different from what the results could superficially suggest at, at first glance. And what might those obstacles be very roughly? I know there are a great many, so if you can summarise them for us. Yes, I suppose the first one is the appointment of the Prime Minister. So under the interim provision, which was passed in the 2017 Constitution, the unelected Senate, so that's 250 people who were basically appointed by the military generals who staged the coup in 2014, uh, they will have their votes alongside the votes of the 500 MPs who are just being elected now. That means that you need quite a large majority in parliament to be able to outvote the senators if they all vote en masse for one particular candidate, which is what they did last time. So we'll have to see here, if we're looking at 309 uh, parties, uh, sorry, MPs getting together with the the current opposition parties trying to form a government, they would struggle to get their prime ministerial candidate nominated if all the current government MPs voted along with the senators. The numbers would not add up. So that's one of the first hurdles that they will face. Let's uh, get on to that first Others... hurdle. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, we will continue with that, but because this yeah. is a very big point. So the 309 is right. based on the six-party coalition that Move Forward has announced, and that is... Uh, again, assuming that poor Thai is prepared to join that coalition, contributing its very large numbers, right. it being the runner-up. But there is, at this point, no confirmation from poor Thai that it will actually do so. And even if it were to do so, how stable would such a coalition be, given that poor Thai, what has it got to gain teaming up with Move Forward? Well, it's a dilemma, clearly, for Pertai. They were very much hoping that they were going to win a landslide. They went around telling everybody they were going to win a landslide, that they were going to be the people calling the shots in the wake of this election. They were talking up their chances of getting 250 seats or more. And clearly, those projections were, to put it politely, very optimistic or, or, or exaggerated. There was an attempt to create a self-fulfilling prophecy of Pertai's success, which would sweep everybody along with it. And in the early phase of the election, that seemed to be working out. But as time passed, the move forward current started to rise. We saw lots and lots of people, particularly younger people and people in urban areas, turn to this newer party, perhaps feeling that the, the claims of the Pertai party have been surpassed, exceeded by the possibilities of a party that was more radical, more progressive, and more appealing to a generation of younger voters who were very disenchanted with the generals who've been running the country for the past nine years. And Professor, before I cut in, likely what you were going to be discussing was the extra constitutional, extra parliamentary interventions and the dissolutions that have come to be associated with, I suppose, military-backed governments in Thailand. Now, that could happen again. You were on the ground. Now, these election rallies, they are chaotic. A lot of things were promised. And already we're hearing uh, allegations of violation of rules. Every party, most of them, have been accused of doing something that is considered irregular. So the chances of anyone being dissolved or debarred from running as an MP, that's pretty high, right? 
It absolutely is. Yes, Thailand has, has actually dissolved more political parties than any other country in the world over the past 20 years. They've got a, a pretty good track record of doing that. Thaksin's own parties have been dissolved twice. And the Move Forward Party is itself a kind of reincarnation of the Future Forward Party, which ran in the last election. That was dissolved by order of the Constitutional Court and the leading figures in that party, uh, the top executives were banned from political office for 10 years. So that threat is always there, that Move Forward could be banned, that Pertai could be banned, that any of the other parties could be banned. There are an awful lot of rather complicated, obscure and ambiguous regulations governing elections in Thailand, which would make it possible for charges to be brought. Uh, Pitar, the leader of Move Forward, is already being threatened with charges about media share ownership, which was something that was brought up against the, his precursor, Tanatorn of the Future Forward Party. So these possibilities are always waiting in the wings, and that's something else which concentrates the minds of political parties when they're engaged in negotiation about who to join uh, and, forces with, because those on the conservative side may argue that they have access to, to levers of power that could favour or disfavour those kinds of developments. And a final question, because we are running out of time, Professor, I have got to ask us. Now, this after the last election in 2019, you wrote in the New York Times, a hashtag that translates as we are grown up now and we can choose for ourselves. Now, that sentiment has found fruition. Or is that that's one argument in this elections where you have seen this kind of result and a, a rejection of a certain way of thinking, acting, governing in Thailand. Would you say that's so? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. What we see most acutely in this election, of course, existing cleavages based on region, class identity, and prior political allegiances are still there. But generational divide looms the largest as an emerging new cleavage in Thai society. There's a very, very big difference in worldview between people under 30 and people over 30, and their willingness to go along with what were considered to be traditional, natural assumptions about the way Thailand should be organized is much, much less than it was in previous generations. Oh, thanks so much for joining us. Professor Duncan McCargo speaking to us live from Copenhagen.